Want to sell more books? Make sure you're at the Self-Publishing Show live this summer. Meet the biggest names in self-publishing at Europe's largest conference for independent authors. Enjoy two days packed with special guests, an exclusive networking event, and a digital ticket for watching the professionally filmed replay, including bonus sessions not included at the live show. Head over to selfpublishingshow.com slash tickets and secure your spot now. The Self-Publishing Show Live is sponsored by Amazon KDP. On this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I suppose the difference with traditional publishing is you have the publisher looking after 10, 20 authors, well, far more than that. So they're trying to build their schedule around a, a huge array of, of people and authors. Whereas for an indie author, you're just, this is me, I'm looking after me, and then you can move forward whatever pace suits you really. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Uh, sweltering in the British summer heat, but excited, Mark, because in a week's time, in fact, this is going out on Friday, so in a few days' time, we're heading down to London for our I can say our annual, but it's not quite annual because of COVID, but our third indie publishing conference, uh, the self-publishing show live, uh, we believe the biggest gathering of indie authors in Europe, which is exciting. Mm. Yeah, we think so. So I think we'll, we'll have between 700 and 750 people in, in the hall, which is good, more than last year. So um, loads of great speakers coming down. Um, some flying in from the States, we like Damon Courtney from Book Funnels, bringing his family. Dave Chesson is coming over from the States. Um, Kate Pickford, I think, is coming from the States. Yes, even though um, she's English. Yeah, so lots and lots of um, speakers. Craig Martell coming over, loads and loads of people coming over. Um, and also attendees from all around the world. I mean, obviously, most people are from Europe, but I know several Aussies and Kiwis, um, some people from the States coming over. Um yeah, so we're looking forward to it. It's going to be it's going to be fun. Uh, the forecast is for pleasant weather um, next Tuesday night, especially which will be nice because we have our, our kind of drinks reception on the Tuesday night, which spilled out onto the terrace at the uh, South Bank last time, which was very pleasant. Um, as 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 we had people coming up to us saying, "You do you do know that's E. L. James, don't you?" And, uh, oh yes, oh yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'm not sure whether she'll be there this time, but that was, yeah, that was good fun. A few, a few people do just come to the party. They're obviously busy during the day and can't make it, but the party is a good mm. good networking event and, yeah, it makes a big difference. The first year we did it on a cold ship um, and it was very uh, tightly oh, packed. Yeah. But um, last year, yeah, the sun was shining. It was a beautiful June evening in London. So, yeah, standing out on the in the concrete jungle do you that call, is the South Do you call it a ship? Is a ship on the river or is it a boat? There's a boat. A boat on the river, isn't it? Yeah, a ship at sea. But yeah, it was it was also that was the uh it was just before COVID, which was um yeah. we were basically on a floating petri dish for um but, but three no hours one, and no, no one got no, it. Apparently. More people yeah. got COVID from last year, just it was a much lesser yeah. uh lesser disease at that point. Obviously it is again now, but um Yeah. Yeah, no, we got away with it. So that first year could have been a could have been in the newspapers. We were po- Wonder if that would happen. Anyway, yeah. it didn't, and then obviously we couldn't hold on during twenty uh, during the COVID period. But we came back in twenty two, and this is twenty three. Uh, very excited about it. Yeah, we've got some really brilliant sessions, uh, as you say, and I'm um, looking forward to learning. We always want there to be kind of takeaways and inspiration, and or should be one of the two things, um, and then lots of opportunity just to meet other authors. And we've we've we spent some time and effort on that side of things as well. So there'll be genre stands around so you can go and stand with your genre and meet people writing. Same as you. Obviously, we've got a nice big lanyard so you can identify each other and hopefully people with their genres on there. Um, and still a chance to go. Um, I think uh, probably we'll still be selling tickets on this Friday on the weekends, all done electronically. So I don't see any reason not to sell them up to the last moment. So if you go to softpublishingformula.com, forward slash SPS live. And if you can't attend in person, the digital sessions are going to be fantastic this year, above and beyond what we've ever done before. 
So you get all the sessions professionally produced from the conference itself. And then in addition to that, you'll get some one-on-one, uh, not one-on-one, but you'll get some uh, in-person presented sessions that we're going to live stream and then they'll be packaged up for you afterwards. And if you go to, I think it's selfpublishingforum.com forward slash digital for that. Yeah, I, might, oh, I, I think there may, there, may be even, there may even be a button on the on the live sales page that will take yeah. you over to the digital. But yes, um, so you, I, it's yeah, it's going to be fun. We're going to kind of do it as like a second digital conference with some original material this year in August. So and I should say about that that there's an early bird price, which is seventy five, and it goes up after the conference. So you have a few days left if you want to get in on the digital ticket of that that starting price. For those of you can, my, my dog Scout is very excited by the by the early bird price, as you, as you might, might just have heard. I think he's growling. Bird. No, that's that's a very loud wolf. Oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> Good for scouts. Um, good. Yeah. So you're. I know you're hosting a VIP dinner, which I'm not invited. Or I was invited, but I'm, you were invited. I'm not going. Because um, so you, you live miles away, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so you've got that. Then you'll be in London, and then you are off to a film premiere. No, not a film. Well, no. Actually, it could be. I suppose. Yeah. It's, I've, I've been invited to, by Amazon to an event at the British Film Institute on the Wednesday night. So we'll close the conference down. I'll then. Wander down the river, not too far to the BFI for I think it's it's a it's possibly the launch for this uh, creative Amazon's impact on the creative sector. I I did an interview um, with a crew they sent down a couple of weeks ago, which was um, really fun actually. Um, so they they had it was very professional. They had four guys, three cameras, sound guy. There's some drones flying around. So I, I kind of walked to the office and they had a drone flying overhead, which was very entertaining. Um, so yeah, looking forward to seeing that. Um, but then the funny story about that, which I was quite entertaining. My uh, kids' books this year, we had a competition when the second one went out. Well, possibly it was even in the first one, but we had a competition whereby uh, readers, young readers could write reviews and send them to us. Um, so not post today, but send them to us. And the, the one we thought was the best review would, um, would win a week in a house in Southwold which is actually the house that we have in, in Southwood in, in, in Suffolk. And uh, one of the guys from the film crew said, um, I couldn't believe it when I found out that I was coming to interview you because um, my daughter won that competition and I was in your house in February. Huh. <laughs> so, wow. So a really small world. And um, he's a lovely guy. And um, they had, yeah, they, they, they had some family issues. I won't say any more than that, but some family issues that, that meant that they really, really valued the time together and they had a lovely time in the house. Um, and just such a, such a coincidence that it, yeah, it was that his daughter. Wild. And, then, and then he came along. It was just very strange, but, but a nice, you know, sometimes those things happen and they're quite nice when, when they happen like that. So yeah, that, that was, that was lovely. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that film, I think, well, I know it will be on the Amazon website, and I imagine they'll put it on social. And I, they did say there was a chance it might get some TV play as well, which would be pretty mm-hmm. cool. So I know, I know they there's another author that they interviewed, um, and then some like fashion, I think they did, and film or editing, something. But basically, people from creative industries that have, have found that their their lives have been changed by the tools that Amazon's made available. So obviously, I'm very happy to talk about that because you know it's. Amazon Matt has changed my life incredibly over the last ten years. So you know, really happy to to be interviewed about that. So it should be fun yeah. to see that. I don't, I'll I'll let you know when it when it's ready. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, good, excellent. Okay, well, look, uh, should we probably press on and and to our interview today? Uh, this is Ryan Cahill. He's in New Zealand. Ryan writes epic fantasy. And he is somebody who can uh, we can learn from in terms of the way that he cultivates his audience. Uh, he's also gone down this route of these special editions, sort of, I guess, kind of Brandon Sanderson style. Um, and one of his books here, you'll hear in the interview, actually was £55, um, but he's still sold out of them. And that's what happens when you, you work with your audience and you make them a central part uh, of your business operation, which is good for any business, actually, but particularly us as authors. And I guess this sort of builds on um, an interview a couple of weeks ago with Isabel Knight about uh, author PR and so on. Okay, well, look, let's hear from Ryan, then Mark and I will be back for a quick chat at the end of the interview. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. 
Ryan Cahill, welcome to the Self Publishing Show. We're going to be talking about epic fantasy and getting going from zero to where you are now. Um, but first of all, should say you're in New Zealand. We don't have a lot of um, uh, authors on the show from New Zealand. We should have more, I think. We are thinking about going south at some point. <laughs> Maybe not to New Zealand, but probably Australia, which is like next door, so it can't be far. Basically the same. It's only, yeah. you know, a few hours away. Yeah, five hour flight or something. But okay, good. Well, first of all, let's talk about New Zealand a little bit. What's the um what's the author scene like in New Zealand? Honestly, I don't know too much. Uh, I moved here, what is it now? Just about over a year ago. My partner's from New Zealand. So I moved moved from Ireland over here. And it doesn't seem too crazy. I haven't seen many, but there's quite a few in Australia, like you said, just across the pond. Um, so there's a few few people I've connected with over in Australia now who hopefully I'll get to meet over the next year. But strangely enough, I've managed to meet more authors in the UK since I moved to New Zealand than I have Australian ones. Oh, really? Just the way it's fallen. What's it been like moving from Ireland to Australia uh, to New Zealand? That's just it's been strange. It's mm. a totally different culture, totally different environment, atmosphere, and you know, for the first time I know absolutely nobody, which is a weird experience because I also when I moved over is when I moved to being a full-time author. So I went from, you know, having a, a workplace to just basically being a solitary environment in an office, which was a bit of a strange shift to then also move to a place where you know nobody. So it's a, it's been an interesting one. Yeah. So let's talk about the writing then. So you got into this, um, you, well, you, you, I think you took the plunge fairly early into sort of being full-time, probably a little earlier than perhaps the figures should earlier suggest. Than- yeah, earlier than most people would have, yeah. Yeah, so just tell us about that bit. What what stage did you got to and, and, and what sort of made prompted you to start? Well, it was kind of I was I was working in a in a in a pharmaceutical company. I was working as a microbiologist there and um I, I started a new job and they didn't actually need me. They hired me before they needed me. Um, and I was sitting there and I was watching Netflix, quite literally watching Netflix. I had no other work at all. I couldn't get it. I, I just that was the way it worked. You know, they wanted someone in and they needed them in and that was it. And then after a while, I said, you know, what? I'm kind of just wasting time here. I may as well just start writing. And then I started doing that and um, it just kind of grew. And then COVID hit and I had nothing else to do. It just kind of exploded from there and I'd launched in March and it just kind of all snowballed. And were you a big reader before that point? Massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd never written anything before in right. my life. And um, well, maybe like I'd a Pretty sure we had a story right when I was seven that we lost on the computer. But um, yeah, massive reader, right? Since I was small, used to read, you know, two or three books a week. And uh, epic fantasy is what you chose to write. Was that what you were reading mainly? It's what I've always read. It's what I love. I think it's, there's always such a big divide between, you know, the kind of like literary fiction and, and, and fantasy. It's such a massive difference. And the whole third world element and getting lost in, you know, things that aren't real is something that's always captured me. So there was nothing I was ever going to write except for that. At yeah. least in my debut. Can you just describe the genre to us? Yeah, so it's it's what I kind of write is a like classic fantasy with like a modern narrative. And um, so it's very much, you know, kind of the world similar to the likes of likes of Tolkien and Gemmel, but then would be more with a, a modern narrative style like the likes of John Gwynn, um, is is what I'd often get compared to. Okay, so um it's not Middle Earth so much as as a more modern take or yeah, so you would you would have kind of like a Tolkien esque setting. There would be different races. There'd be dragons and magic, and it would be kind of quite high fantasy. But then the reason you'd say epic fantasy usually is the idea of scope, the yeah. idea of a, a larger world, multiple points of view. And um, so I think at the minute, running in my third book, there's fourteen points of view in the book. Okay, um, and there'd be hundreds of named characters, and it's it's about four hundred and thirty seven thousand words long. So it's a so that was a big, the big other book. the other thing I was going to ask about the sort of defining characteristic of epic fantasies they do tend to be tomes is that the right word big books yeah like tra- traditionally when I think there's a bit of a bit of a, a landscape of battle going on between traditional publishing and indie publishing at the minute in many different genres but traditionally epic fantasy and classic fantasy is larger tomes which kind of goes against the grain for what works in indie publishing you know we're usually told short and fast get them out you know it's frequency of release over anything else well not over anything else obviously quality of content but the frequency of release is massive so it's kind of daunting it was strange for me because classic epic fantasy is a, is a massive genre it's not niche at all no. but there wasn't much competition in that specific area of it when you go to the indie world because you know it's 
it's against what you usually have trying to find that epic scope and there's those larger books they're not always there how long did it take you to write your first book then um i probably wrote my first book in a, about i could say a year but the reality was the first six seven months i wasn't really writing it you know when you kind of you started writing your first book ever and you're kind of you're touching it a little bit but when i really knuckled down and, and got to it was probably about about five or six months um and then that pace just kind of quickened so as the last book which was 400 yeah like i said 437,000 words that was written edited and published in nine months and in terms of story and structure did you follow any sort of um non-fiction books save the cat and stuff like that or did you just do this off your gut from reading all the books you'd read very much off off my gut the only kind of craft stuff i'd i'd looked at really um, I didn't look at it, I listened to was with writing excuses, Brandon Sanderson's podcast. And I watched all of his lectures um from the university that he posted for free on YouTube, and they were amazing. And just going through that, I didn't follow any set structure. I felt like I should. You know, you feel like a fraud and you're listening to these and people are talking about the different structures, but then it just it took away the joy for me. I was kind of losing, yeah. I was trying to fit to a certain structure and it just wasn't working for my brain. And when you've got 14 POVs in your book, you still have a main character. Do you, would you still identify a main character? And would that be the person who, who has the kind of hero's journey? Yeah, so it's kind of the way I've done the book, it's almost like a pseudo main character. So the, the first book has one very core POV, you take about 70% of the book. Okay, and then there's a few other ones that are put throughout it for different perspectives. And then when you go to the second book, his point of view drops to 34%, I think, 33, 34%. And the other characters take a lot more of the, the front seat. And he goes to the third book, and now his point of view drops to about 26, 27%. And the idea being that I think a lot of people would still view him as the, the main character, but his purpose in the first book a lot is almost not an audience proxy like you'd see in movies, but the idea is basically to give that traditional feeling of a hero's journey that people get so they, they have something to cling on to and then it kind of drags them into the rest of the series where it explodes and for me it was a way of kind of capturing the nostalgia that i would have had when i was reading those classic fantasies when i was younger but as an adult so it's very much aimed towards adults it's a, an adult fantasy and there's a lot of people now who might be picking it up as their first book in fantasy and i wanted to make it accessible by not basically throwing game of thrones in there immediately and given something to grab onto, something familiar that worked for, for me when I was younger, but yeah, like aging it up. Yeah. Okay, so you wrote this book, and in terms of marketing it and publishing, did you did you initially think you would go out and find a publisher, or did you, you were, were you aware of indie publishing right from the beginning? Well, when I had started writing, I was. So I probably only came into like the idea of indie publishing maybe a few months before I started writing, but as soon as I did, I'd never queried, never did anything. It was just, that was the avenue. Mostly because I'm too impatient. Yeah. And I'm just, I knew, I was like, I wasn't going to sit there and wait. I was like, I have this book here. And I think, actually, I listened to a lot of this, I think, this podcast, and then like Joanna Penn, and um, Six Figure Authors. And I just, I used to go for walks during COVID. And I go for like two or three hours and just podcast, podcast, podcast. You know, maybe, you know, I go every day. And then I remember one podcast where Mark was talking about, um, about rapid release i think two of you were talking about rapid release and the subject came up and it was the idea of if you have a book you know why would you sit on it and mm -hmm. as soon as you're sitting on it that's that's dead money you know you're not earning anything but you have a book finished and that kind of got in my head too and i was like no not waiting no way i'm waiting yeah it's Just a very my own impatience it is a very different experience my friends who are traditionally published and seeing them wait 18 months two years for one book to go through the process and get released does seem a bit odd and old-fashioned <laughs> That's it exactly. I have, I have friends now who have made over the past two years and they've released one book and say the second book came out maybe a few months ago and now I'm finishing my sixth yeah. and, and they're not small. They're the large books and they're, they're coming out now and the difference in speed is just insane because the, the way you can build a readership, the kind of what I would call like the density of content that you can release in just a small period of time can just capture people so much faster. You don't have those peaks and we do, but not, not as rap, not as much those peaks and troughs they have in, in traditional publishing that kind of 
kind of leaves you at the mercy of the advertising spend of your publisher for the next release. Yeah. And it's uh, such an obvious thing to me. It must be frustrating for trad authors who've had a hit. And then this long period of time, there's no other industry where, where you wouldn't want to quickly follow it up. And if you think about music, if I knew a guy, Boo, what was his name? Boo, so he's quite a famous, locally famous musician who wrote a big hit. He, he released it. It got into the charts, but then the record company couldn't, follow, couldn't do the manufacturing quickly. And that was the old days of CDs or whatever. Couldn't do the manufacturing, dropped out of the charts. A few years later, somebody else had a massive hit with it. I'll think of it all in the names in a second. But I remember talking to him and him saying that was the moment they needed to get, they yeah. needed to jump on that and then get the next song out and the next song out. And they, his record company, Two Swan, couldn't do it. That makes sense to me, right? That's an indie author way of doing things. We just, we, we get yeah. stuff out there. Trad, you've got to feel sorry for those authors. They must lose that momentum, lose that opportunity to I make know, it big. I know an author who had a massive release last year, huge tomes of books, okay? He had book two, and that's made it more obvious now, but he had book two turned in before book one's release and still hasn't received the okay for the edits back. That was a year ago. So, you know, way ahead of schedule, books ready to go and just being told, no, I suppose the difference with traditional publishing is you have the publisher looking after, you know, 10, 20 authors, or far more than that. So they're trying to build their schedule around a, a huge array of, of people and authors. Whereas for an indie author, you just, this is me, I'm looking after me. And then you can move forward whatever pace suits you really. Yeah. Yeah. And there are, you know, there are other advantages to trad. It's for, it's for some people, but I'm oh, like, there's you. Loads, yeah. yeah, I'm like you, I've never queried. It's never been attractive to me. It's just not something I want to do. And the control I think is, is the main thing for me anyway. So you've, you've, you've gone down the indie route. You've written your first book. Um, did you yep. go through editing and stuff like that? You knew about that process? Oh, yes. I, I think it's like, like anything for me. I think research is probably the most important part of, of anything, especially publishing. And whether you're trad or whether you're in the, you know, the more you know about publishing, the better position you're going to be in. So I spent a lot of time going through different editors, following people on Twitter, following people everywhere, just to find who was going to work. And um, I think now at this stage and right the way through, I haven't released anything, not even the vela length that hasn't been fully beta read, fully copy edited and fully proofread. Um, which is just, it's a really important process for me because I think the more and more I learned, one of the things that I think really worked for me was that I wanted to make sure that my books were as indistinguishable from traditionally published books as, as possible. Because I think when you're in the sphere of indie publishing, you feel like everybody knows what indie publishing is. But the reality is they don't. Right. So when you're on Amazon and you're selling your books, 90% of your readership don't know what indie publishing is. They don't care. They just want a nice book. They want to enjoy themselves. And if they can find a fantastic book, that's everything. So for me, trying to blur that line on Amazon was what I just needed to do. And obviously your first line is your blurb and your cover. But once they get into the book, you know, they start seeing typos everywhere. They start seeing just chunks of, you know, made butler dialogue and, and everything just tossed in there. Then it's, it's just a red flag straight away. So I think for me, it was just a non-negotiable. So you, you released book one by itself? Yeah, so I had, I had a novella. Basically what I did was I wanted to have like, um, like a reader magnet, so have like a, a mailing list sign up. And I wanted to, to find a way to really create a closed loop for my books. So I had a novella. I'd released the first half of it as two short stories on a mailing list beforehand. And then when I wrote the other two short stories, I combined it into a full novella. And, and that was kind of published. So in a way, half before, half after. Um, and that kind of worked to build a bit of a readership. And then now it's been, that's been massive. The novella has been huge. It's had, you know, 60, 70,000 downloads and it kind of just feeds into the series the whole time. And I've kind of made it so that it's not required reading, but it's required reading. And there's a, a big argument in the community. It's weird for me to say the community. Your, 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 your reader yeah, community. Kind of stuff now. Yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's a big argument between the, of the reading orders. Because right. I've written it, I wrote it in a way so I wanted to make it as versatile as possible. So I could capture a reader after they read the first book to keep them, or I could get them into the first book by giving them a sample. So I kind of made it that it could be read either way and didn't really anticipate the kind of war of words that I would see in the readership, which has been absolutely hilarious. Yeah, uh, sounds great. I love the fact that you're referring to your community, your reader community. That's how far you've come. Yeah, it, no, it's, it's mind-blowing. 
Um, and it's probably one of the things for me about fantasy that goes beyond, I would say, almost all other genres. Because every reader, every genre has communities and they have readerships. Well, I think there's something very unique when it comes to fantasy because there's just this depth of a world that's not our own. And I think people just cling to it and, and dive into it so much deeper because inherently when you're telling the story, there's parts of this whole new world people have never seen and they're learning, depending on what you do, like for mine, they're learning new languages, new pantheons of gods, they're learning fauna, flora, learning everything. So by the time they're finishing the books, they've learned so much about a different world that they're just so deep and invested. It's I have, I have a reader who's read the series eight times in two years. Wow. And she can correct me. And it's 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 crazy. But well, it's very you, cool. you should employ her. She could be your Bible person when you write your next She's book. She's already and... gone onto the beta reader team yeah. and just walked onto it, basically. So wh- when was this? When did you release your first book? So the first book was March, March 2021. 21, okay. And that's when you moved south as well. Yeah, so I released it in March 2021. And then in May, we, we'd planned to move. So the way it ended up working was I was not earning enough. I was earning good money. Like, realistically, I was earning good money, a lot, a lot more than most people would at, at that early stage. I was very lucky. Um, but it wasn't enough to, to, trust it, to trust myself in going full time because it could disappear next month. Um, and even if it didn't disappear next month, it probably still wasn't enough to live off. Um, but I had no choice. We moved over in May and then New Zealand had its... No, no, we didn't. I left my job in May. We moved in July. And then as I arrived, we had two weeks in New Zealand quarantine, six days in freedom. And then New Zealand went into its first extreme lockdown since the very start. And I was stuck for six months. They were harsh lockdowns, weren't they, in New Zealand? Yeah, it, I think it wasn't too bad until this one. And then this one, they locked down from like late July, early August until Christmas. And I couldn't go, even if I wanted to go and look for a job, I I couldn't. So I said, you know what, let's just keep writing. And then I launched book two. So I think the novella officially came out in June that year. And then I launched book two on New Year's Eve. Um, And then from book two, as soon as book two launched, everything just skyrocketed. And my sales quadrupled from book two launched. And that was just it. There was no, no going back there. Um, and that's kind of been the pattern ever since, which has been really nice, is release the main book and then release a novella maybe five or six months later, and then another main book and then a novella and main book and novella. And it's it's been yeah, really, really good since then. Why do you do the novellas in between the main books? Well, there's there's two there's, there's a few reasons. And you know, from a just from a reader perspective, it, it gives me a chance to explore parts of the world that maybe would be a bit tangential when I'm writing the series and would kind of destroy pacing but I think they're really fantastic stories and I want to tell them. And then my readers really want them because they start loving the characters and they want to find out. And then what I'm also able to do is I'm able to create a lot of lore and world references and Easter eggs that because epic fantasy, it's it's quite a reread. Rereads are a big thing in epic fantasy because usually readers are kind of conditioned that books will be years and years apart. So they'll reread the series before the next one comes out. So what I wanted to do was it's kind of reward the readers that reread so that in each novella, I add loads of Easter eggs that later in the series, they'll be able to go, oh, oh this relates to this and, right. and tie threads. And, and then for me, what it also did from an author perspective, from a publishing perspective, is it created this, you know, the way basically your read through, the further you go through the series, your read through should be higher because people are more invested. You know, people who go from book one to book two could be 60%, then, then you'd hope it's at least 80% from two to three. And you, you kind of create a pseudo longer series by using the novellas because by the time people are on book three, they're actually on book five. Yeah. And then when they're going, the next, the novella makes it book six. So there's only three main books released in the series, but the readers have read six. So, you know, part of the theory for me was that you should see, um, quite a strong increase then. It creates these small gaps and I put the novellas at 99 cent or free for my first novella. And the idea being that they're so accessible for readers that, you know, once they read book one, they automatically get the free one. And now before they hit book two, they've already read two. And so like for me, I've seen fairly, like it, it, it's it's worked really well. Like I can look at my read through, obviously read through isn't, I don't get too granular with it, 
But when I let my months settle after releases, and then I can kind of look at what I'm selling each way as I'm going through, my read through for Kindle Limit is, is probably 80% plus from book one to two. And it's touching 90% for just ebook sales. Um, and then it just goes higher. And so it's it, it's very, very high, and um, which has been really, really nice for trying to, you know, survive. Yeah, well, that's a great testament as well to your writing. Let's talk about the marketing then. So how did you approach marketing at the beginning and what are you doing now? Well, I, I, I took a very heavy, you know, very heavy, heavy community and content-based marketing approach. Like I'm from listening to you guys and listening to another guy I love is uh, David Gochran, mm. um, who's fantastic. And one of the things that got pushed a lot was websites and mailing lists. And I just, I love the idea. And the idea for me was I wanted to create, from the very get-go, I wanted to create a community. I wanted to create something that would kind of bring readers in and then have like a self-sustaining environment. So say like I have my Discord, which I started, um, which is a like a funny story, how the fact that I just decided to send out a free paperback book one time I did a giveaway. I went to um, uh, a woman in Denmark who now fast forward two years later is helping to build my wiki page. She's an admin on my Discord server. She's a beta reader. Wow. And that's just, yeah, it worked amazingly. But that Discord server now has, you know, five, 600 people on it. And then my mailing list, I think I've turned it a few times with about seven or 8,000 people on that now with an open rate of like 64, 65%, which is pretty solidly high. And that's, kind of what I wanted to do from the start and with the mailing list. I think a lot of authors who start them and then quit them is because they're using them as a, like an avenue for giving news. Um, as opposed to an opportunity to show your readers what you're like. So obviously you have to use it for an avenue for giving news to your readers, new releases and stuff, but I've kind of always approached it in the vein that I want to write them the same way I write my books so that I'll kind of, I write them trying to insert my humor and joke about things and, and really kind of just put myself down. I'll sit down for a newsletter. It'll take me about three hours. And that's kind of the approach I took for marketing from the, from the very start, you know, distinguishing marketing from advertising. But um, was, was very much a, yeah, a community idea. I wanted to build this place. People would come. And then on my website, I went and I took my maps that I got made, put them on the website. I took my glossaries and I, like I built my own glossaries and put them on my website and the idea of being in all my eBooks, then I will link, say, hey, if you want to get this map where you can actually zoom in and use it, go onto my website. Here it is. And if you want to get the glossaries when you're reading, go onto my website. Here it is. And then I have my book progress on my website, how far I'm through in different drafts and areas. And what it's done is it, it keeps sending all my readers straight from my eBooks to my website for things they want as opposed to things I want. And for me, I think that's been massive. So I don't send them there as much to go download the free novella. I send them there to, to use the map. But then naturally when they're there, they go, oh, free book. And they get that down. And, and that's, that's worked really, really, really well for me. So you are getting quite a bit of traffic to your own website, which is always valuable. Oh, yeah. I, I think we passed 100,000 hits and um, with about fifty or 60,000 coming this year alone. Wow. Like which which has been for me fantastic because I'm not selling anything direct on the website and it's just funneling people towards it. And I can see that the traffic goes very heavily towards the maps, the glossary, um, the the book, and then also I have like um like an art section where any art that I've commissioned or fan art, I usually try and throw up there too. And then the book progress page, which I didn't think would get a lot of traffic. You know, I try to update it like weekly, but it gets a lot of hits, which is which is really cool. Makes it uh Seemed to me that um, uh, you're ready for a Brandon Sanderson style Kickstarter. You know, the- <laughs> I don't think I'm, I'm there yet, but <laughs> I, I think that's the kind of stuff. Like he has his his progress. M- um, m- maybe that's where a, I took that. Maybe not a forty million dollar one, but you know, it sounds like you've got an audience who would mm-hmm. invest in you and and would would pay more for a bound edition, etc. Well, so what we actually did recently, so we're just just about sold out now. So I didn't do a Kickstarter. But there is a, a bookstore called The Broken Binding who are based in the UK who do fantastic special editions. They started around the time I did and they've gotten very big with a lot of the big five publishers. Um, but I've grown with them and they started selling my books and we started selling maybe a few hundred hardbacks in the first year to a few thousand the next year. And then they do my launches for the books. So we do 50 numbered copies. We do like 100 signed line of datas. And we did the launch this year for the third book. And um, 
I was watching it like I was like a nervous child and I was hitting refresh. And then I just got this thing saying, you know, this site isn't working essentially. And then I got an email, I got a text from the guy who runs the company and he was like, you broke the website. I was like, what do you mean you broke the website? He's like, well, we, we broke it. It went up for a second. The numbered copies are gone. And, and now nobody can use the website. So they had to fix it. And then there was a few hundred gone in, I think it was the first like four or five minutes, which was ridiculous. Mm. So we moved on to making a special edition um, of the book. And it's, it's the proofs have come through and actually the book's finished now. So we got it. It's cloth bound, um, real like gold leaf gilded edges. We have foiling. The, a new cover was done by an artist in Korea. And then we have double page color illustrations from Randy Vargas, who does art for Brandon Sanderson, and then um, Felix Ortiz, who's just an amazing artist. And um, yeah, that's sold nearly all the full 1,500 copies now. Um, and they're £55 a piece. Wow. So it's, yeah. You see, the difference what we found was we hit the spec level of like Grimo Press and Rida. And um, so we have like, Acid-free paper, we have sewn binding, we have foil stamping, gilded edges, which take 28 days to gild. And it was really, really high spec. But we're actually quite a bit below the market price for those books. When we released them, we actually had a couple of people, which blew my mind, a couple of people emailing saying, hey, these don't cost enough. <laughs> because they have kind of like book collectors and they also have like book resellers who are quite a large part of their audience. And you know, they won't get as much value on the other side if the books don't cost enough at the start. And it was, uh, it blew my mind. Yeah. I think the stuff for us is we had so many illustrations, you put so much into it. We have four or five artists, um, six artists actually, I think from around the world, putting illustrations in the book. And then the, the quality we made it to we were really, really high. So I think like it was weird for me to release a 55 pound book and have people say, thank you for keeping it affordable. Yeah, which was strange. <laughs> well, that's um, that's again testament to the audience that you've built. Um, let's talk about the sort of more day to day marketing. Then are you you presumably are running paid ads uh, to your books, and, and which markets? By the way, you're in New Zealand. You're from yep. Ireland, so I guess I'm from the Ireland, U- yeah. UK and dot com are probably your two big art markets. Are they UK dot com and Australia? And yeah, I think Australia and the UK switch sometimes, and then there's months where the UK is a lot higher. Um, so I, I do run, I run paid ads, but I only probably spend about about six hundred dollars, uh, like US dollars a month, um, on those. Oh, is that all? And the way it worked was that's I see it's weird because some people say that's crazy, that's so much money, and then I know other people who say, "How are you selling books?" Yeah. Um, with that little spend, and I think it hasn't. Book one hasn't dropped out of the top five or six thousand uh, since I launched, and um, so it stayed pretty sticky up there. Yeah. Um, which which has been really good. So at first I launched at ninety nine cent, and then when I saw the sales kind of take a slight dip, I brought the price to two ninety nine and started doing paid ads. I just I brought it up really really slowly, only using Amazon ads. Um, I've tested a few others, but I found the Amazon ones were getting the most consistent results for me. Um. Yeah, like day to day, that's the only advertising. You're in Kindle Unlimited and Select, I think. Yeah. yeah. So that's that obviously worked well for you as well. And again, I think with the size of Epic Fantasy books, that's not a bad um a bad option. Yeah. Kindle Unlimited, I think Kindle Unlimited is part of what makes it makes the indie competition against Trad for these size books, it makes it feasible. So, you know, I have a lot of people I know who kind of you know, they give out about Amazon just because they were told to, but for me. They made this. They made me possible in the independent yeah. publishing for me anyway, um, and continued to do so. So I think for a long while it was about seventy five plus percent of my income, um, but that's dropped not because Kindle Limited has dropped, but because other avenues have come through. Probably about, about sixty, um, and I've seen a shift from the US being really dominant to Australia and UK starting to to catch up a bit more. So I'd say like the UK is probably was about nine or 10% of my market. And now it's about 25. Mm. And so there has been quite a shift, which has been, it's good to see because I don't like to be dependent on any one particular thing. And what about your home nations, about New Zealand and Ireland? Are you selling books there? It's a tough one. So with New Zealand, because they're Australia for Amazon, I can't really tell. 
um, and Ireland's UK for Amazon. But I know the f- fun fact is I know there's bookstores in the US, in Washington and LA and a few other places who stock my books. Um, but I couldn't get a signing in Ireland, even though I had a book club who wanted to order, I think it was like 60 hardbacks. So they're already sold. These guys are like, this is it. We want to buy them. So all I needed to do was get a bookshop to place an order for 60 and we give them the money. It's sold already. And I couldn't get a signing. Wow. Uh, I couldn't get a single bookshop who would let me come in. Um, whereas over in the States and then over in the UK, not a problem at all. We've sent out thousands of books to the broker binding in the UK and then the US, they've stocked in bookstores, but yeah. then in Ireland, they wouldn't. It's actually you think because it's still a bit trad focused in Ireland or? Yeah, I think it's that. And I think there is, there is like a bit of a look down on, on fantasy as a genre which I think happens in a lot of different places across. It's kind of viewed as a little bit, you know, not literary. Um, what I suppose depends on what your definition of literary is, but it's still one of the biggest selling genres in the world. Yeah. But I think it's just, it's just, it's just the way there, it is. It's a always, strange one. I think trad publishing has always been slightly snobby about it, despite Tolkien and so on. Um, but Ireland seems like, like the obvious place for epic fantasy. I mean, the, I mean, the, the sort of no. almost folklore aspect of Ireland and, um, Game of Thrones filmed in the north, I guess, and probably the south as well. So anyway, there you go. I think I think there's quite a, a like rapacious readership for it in Ireland, but I think yeah. some of the bookstores are still a bit slow, and that I think indie publishing isn't quite a known thing as much as it should be among the book community. I think they are two separate communities. I, I've found, and it's something that I've noticed since since I have started to target more th- more trad things. I've noticed my print copies exploding, yeah. selling way more than I would have. Um, and that's very much the focus for the people who are used to going into bookstores and browsing are a very different audience than people who browse Amazon. So like that's an avenue to explore as well as if you can find that place where they cross, you can definitely increase your, your print sales, which is starting to happen for me, a lot more direct sales to bookstores and stuff. Um, but I think it, it takes a while. Yeah. We should say Ireland has produced some of the great literary writers uh, of um, oh, over yeah. time as well. So maybe that's they're still hoping for the next great uh, great novel. It's going to come that route rather than indie. But anyway, anyway. Um, so where are you going now? How many books have you got out in the series, and what what are your plans for the next year or two? So there's five at the minute, three main books and two novellas, and we're just short of a million words in the series, which is which is pretty cool. And I'm going to break that now soon. So I'm on the sixth novella. I'm on the sixth book, which is a novella now. Um, and I call them novellas, but I don't know if they technically are. Don't, so t- the don't tell me there are 100,000. 47. Oh, 47 okay. well, no, 47,000, <laughs> which, you know, is technically yeah. novel territory, but I yeah. don't think I'd get away with calling it a novella if it was 100. Um, no. But it, this third one is probably going to hit similar around the, f- the mid 40s, maybe touching 50. There are probably some romance so there, series that are averaging about 50,000 words. So it's not far off um, a series of novels, but yeah. 30 to 40. So I think, I think when your main books are 400 and something That's thousand, the counts. My thought it? process, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have that. And I try to keep the, the larger books around a year, like not much more than a year to a year and a half apart, because I'm trying to, I don't want to chase the indie mindset of, you know, a book's coming out every month or every two months or every three months, because it's just not achievable in no. the genre without, you know, the stress crippling me. So, you know, it's something I've I've tried to to say with people, and it's a re- part of the reason why I released the novellas because for two reasons it gives me that kind of little bit of trust um with with the with the readership because you know the more books you release the more the more they trust you. So I'm kind of saying, hey, look, I'm not going to be able to get these massive books out all the time, but I I am consistently finishing books, and I'm going to give it to you. And you know, in between these bigger books, here's something smaller, and it kind of keeps them there. And I I notice the difference. When um, last year, when I released my book at the start of January, and then you can see like anything, you have a, a spike and then it kind of starts to tail. Um, and then it was leveling out around and dropping around around May when I released the novella and then ticked back up again and then c- continued. So my income with those two releases stayed pretty consistent for all of last year. So it, it really does help with that anyway, like keeping that spike and keeping readers flowing in. Have you had any film or TV interest? No, not yet, which is annoying. Um, yeah. I do know a friend, I say, I say annoying, I don't know many people have, I have a, I have a friend who's had some, some really good interest soon. 
and he's put me on to some people. So that'd be really cool. Yeah. Um, but I have assigned with, I signed with John Gerald, um, maybe eight months ago. He's the guy who published the first Wheel of Time book. Um, and he has some fantastic authors on his roster. And I, I signed with him with the idea of, hey, this series is not going traditionally published, but what I want to do is I want to find as many languages as we can get this book into. Yeah. You know, but um, yeah, so the idea being that I want John to kind of come to me. He's working with me and he understands that I'm an indie author. And he understands what I want. The idea being that maybe later to diversify income streams, you might look that way. But for now, what we're trying to do is, is push it across the world. Um, and we've gotten some some great interest and we've signed a couple of deals um, and we're hoping to get a few more languages now soon, uh, which would be really, really nice. And it's that kind of idea of, again, diversifying an income stream and, and having having to come from different places, yeah. which is is what I really want. And I did the same with the audio books. And- yeah, I noticed your audio books are published. Um, so you've, you've outsourced that, I guess. Uh, who is that? It's got yeah. them. Uh, Podium, is it? Podium. Yeah. And that's good. I, mean, I think Epic Fantasy goes down well in audiobooks, isn't it? It's, um, uh, it seems to be quite yeah. a strong, strong part of the market. We get quite a good value for credit. Yes. Credit exactly. is the massive way people spend it. So, yeah. Like even this new one is 44 hours of an audiobook. Yeah. So, you know, you, it's a no brainer. That's, that's a return, you know, well, flight, return flight to New Zealand from London. <laughs> you could... Like, and if you listen to audiobooks the way I listen to, then it's about three months worth of yeah. listening. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ryan, well, it's been really interesting chatting to you. You've done absolutely fantastic work. Um, and I, I think it's a testament to kind of the indie world that you can tune yourself in. If you've got your wits about you, which you clearly have, you can tune yourself into it ahead of the writing process, get things in place, and you've really hit the ground running. That's probably, for me, if I was like to say anything to anyone looking to write at all, it is just don't rush into it. And that was the biggest thing for me was, was I spent months and months and months just walking, listening to you guys on podcasts, looking up everything I could. And the idea being that like, once you publish, the snowball falls down the hill. And whether it does well or not, it doesn't matter because if it doesn't do well, then you've released it, your momentum has gone and you're sitting there worrying over what you're going to do next. And if it does do well, then you now have the clock ticking in the back of your head. So the more time you take before you release, the better position you put yourself in. Yeah. And it's the way I look at it anyway. I think people always say, you know, you need a bit of luck and you do need a bit of luck. But if you haven't put the work in and then luck comes along, it's not going to matter. So, yeah, that was the way I looked at it anyway. Brilliant. Well, look, we are talking potentially about coming to Australia next year. So if we do, you'll have to get on an intern. I call, I call it an internal flight. It's obviously an international flight, but... um. Yeah. <laughs> to, to the next. To the no, I do. I, I come over to the UK and stuff as well. I'm over, actually over the UK for a convention in September, and I'm going to Dragon Con in Atlanta in the US as oh, well, yeah. just before that, and um, which is intimidating as hell. It's it's like a hundred thousand attendees. That's huge, isn't it? Um, Dragon Con. Yeah. yeah. So like, I managed to get a professional. I'm attending professional at both both events. Would be, be really really cool to see them all. But I try to go over to the UK you know, once or twice a year. But um, Australia would be easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll definitely be in touch because I think you'd be a really interesting person to be on a panel or, or you know, be on stage at some point and tell us about your your systems and, and how you've worked. It's, 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 oh, it's, I'd be... Yeah, yeah. I was only saying to, to a group I have, we have a Slack group, and I was saying it's a bit strange to be going on the podcast that I was listening to before I was even publishing, Yeah, well, um, which, which was a nice feeling. You brought value. And I do like, if you're watching on YouTube, to see a little R2-D2. Uh, looks like... I was going to say, I now realize there's something in front of the R2-D2, but I actually thought this is very nerdy. You've got the R2-D2 from the throne room scene with his medal uh, at the end, but actually I think it's just <laughs> something standing in front of it. But it's no, no, so actually what it is, it's, it's a tiny sign with a tiny R2-D2 on top. It's a t- so you can see the little white just over here? Yeah. And that's actually a tiny R2-D2 sitting oh. on a black sign. Oh. It's kind of like saying this is R2-D2. Yes, brilliant. Love it. Yeah. Sci-fi and fancy aren't quite closely related. I spent a whole Christmas where I should have been with family building a Lego Watch 2 There you I go. Suppose that's part and parcel. In- it's work, <laughs> it's work <laughs> well done. Um, brilliant. Ryan, thank you so much indeed for being on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been great. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. It's Ryan in uh, New Zealand and, uh, yeah, uh, epic fantasy. Goes again. He does rapid release epic fantasy and very long books, which is quite a tall order. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I've uh, always impressed with people who can 
put it, put out good quality stuff on a short timetable. It's not necessarily something that I'm, you know, I think three books a year for me is, is about kind of optimum for me at the moment, maybe four if I'm lucky. Um, mm. But then there are lots of other competing <laughs> things that demand, say and say for you, you know, it's very difficult to, you know, to just focus on, on the one thing. But um, there's, a, there's an odd trends in terms of book length at the moment because you get, Epic Fantasy has always been quite long, but mm-hmm. the, um, uh, the Zodiac Academy last book, I think was like 900 Very pages. Yes. Uh, and that's in the ro- a romance subgenre. But a lot of romance books actually are quite short at the moment as well. But I think for KU, longer books obviously make more sense. You get paid per page read, although there is a maximum yeah. limit, which I noticed we bumped up against recently because I put together Robert Story's set as a complete set. And I, I think we don't get paid for the last something. It wasn't a, a deal mm. breaker, but you know, this 3,000 pages or something like that is the maximum you can yeah, get paid yeah. for on a single title, but it's something worth considering. Um, yeah, I guess, I, you know, the publishing industry probably has a fairly strict criteria. And I think that's another indie thing is the book's worth what you think it's worth. And if, um, uh, you know, Caroline and Suzanne, for instance, think this is how we're going to tell the story, that's absolutely what it should be. And what they don't want is someone leaning over their shoulder saying, I want you to cut 50% of this novel out, which probably would not have helped the fans get what they want. No, that's right. So you have you know, pretty much unfettered flexibility when it comes to doing things this way, which is is great for which you know creatively you're not restricted in any way. So you know makes why wouldn't you do it, do it this way? And just another reason to another yeah. tick in the box for independent publishing. Yeah, yeah, independent publishing. Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, last chance for you to come and see us live in person. Come and say hello. Shake our hand or get a selfie, whatever you want. Uh, next week in London, if you want to join us, come to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS live. And we'll see you at our conference. The next interview will be with one of the people who's presenting at the conference, Christina Stanley. We're going to be talking about development and story, uh, the heart of everything we do. That is next week. And uh, I can't wait to see you if you're coming on Tuesday and Wednesday in London. We'll see you then. All that remains for me to say is a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.